research. So um, when we get to the questions at the end, we can probably just have an open discussion and I'll listen to the things that you have to say. But um, anyway, um, this is a, a project about management options for agriculture, wastewater for antibiotic removal. And so um, the objective of the project, there, there was kind of um, three different parts to it. And they wanted to develop a treatment method for removing um, antimicrobials from agriculture wastewaters. But the first part was just to determine the partition coefficients of antimicrobials in, in actual wastewater. So um, figuring out, you know, really where the antimicrobials were, if they were in the suspended solid, the dissolved organics, and then could flocculation work as a treatment process for that. Um, and then the, the second part was to determine the optimal concentrations of the selected flocculants um, to remove these suspended solids. And then the final part was just kind of to put this all together and develop an, an advanced treatment method. So the first part um, was, was conducted by primarily by um, Catherine Woodward, who was a PhD student from Tufts University, um, working with some of our ARS colleagues at um, uh, Fargo and then um, and Dr. Woodbury at uh, Medemo Research Center. So they were determining how the antimicrobials behave in the environment. And so um, we know that antimicrobials accumulate on the pen surface and can be collected um, with the manure when, when the pens are clean and then land applied. But they can also be transported um, through the precipitation um, in the runoff to a holding pond where they may eventually be um, applied as, as irrigation water. And the question was, if, if we're repeatedly applying these low levels of antimicrobials um, onto the soils, through maybe like a fixed irrigation system or something, are we producing the conditions when we could increase antimicrobial resistance? And so a lot of the laboratory studies that have been done, um, they looked at, at partition uh, coefficients of antimicrobials, but they weren't done using actual wastewater. And so that is what this project set out to do, was to they use um, radio-labeled antimicrobials in, to measure uh, partition coefficients in actual wastewater. And what they found was that the partition coefficients were actually quite a bit lower than what had been um, calculated using, say, just a water-soil mixture. And so, um, you know, the, the conclusion was that, that the wastewater is, is very, um, it, it varies a lot. And so um, any treatment technology would have to account for, for a lot of this, this variability in the wastewater. Certainly didn't just reflect what we could find in the laboratory. Um, so the conclusions from that, that first introductory project was that, that antimicrobials in the environment can behave very differently from what is in the laboratory. And um, even though we could remove the suspended solids from the wastewater, there were still some antimicrobials that were in the water portion. Um, and so we, we needed to figure out a way to also remove those. And so there needed to be some ad additional treatment. Uh, so the second uh, part of the study was to determine the optimal concentration of some selected coagulants. And again, this was part of Catherine's uh, PhD project that she worked on. And so um, there was a bunch of different coagulants that were selected. There was um, some polymers, um, alum and lime. And, um, and when she um, analyzed the, the partition coefficients and she found that um, alum really worked the best and it was also um, very economically processed, um, promising. So just kind of move forward with just alum at that point. But um, because of the, of the variability in the, um, in the wastewater, <coughs> she didn't want to just add it at the minimum concentration that was needed. She wanted to add in um, a, an abundant amount so that we could make sure that we could account for the variability to, to get all of the suspended solids. So, um, so what she concluded from her work was that alum could partially remove certain antibiotics from the wastewater. Um, Tylosin was not removed um, from the sediment by the coagulants alone. And, um, and that was because there's um, different metabolites of, of Tylosin that were, that were present. And so there was additional studies that were needed for that. Um, but they also felt that pre-treating pre with flocculation could improve some of the, the physical and chemical characteristics um, that would be needed for, for the wastewater treatment. And so the, the rest of the project is gonna focus on, on this part because those two um, presentations were actually presented last year at ASABE by Catherine. So, um, but this is about more the development of the wastewater treatment agent 
um, using um, diatomaceous earth as a binding agent. And this project was um, led by Bobby Stroma, who was a postdoc in our in our lab. So um, looking at diatomaceous earth, it's just um, fossilized remains of diatoms. It's, it's natural, it's negatively charged, and it's um, distributed worldwide. So it's very, very common product, very easy to, to um, obtain. And then when we were trying to decide which antimicrobials to, to look at, um, we selected a tylosin because it is used um, in, the, in the beef, dairy, pork, and poultry industry. Um, it's a macrolid. And um, about up to 80% of the tylosin that is excreted um, really is just undigested and, and is excreted. And a lot of the metabolites are active. Um, now, tylosin itself is not used in human medicine, but it is a macrolid, which is, there are the macrolids that are used in, in human uh, medicine. Uh, we also looked at port uh, tetracycline. Um, again, it, it's used in the animal industry. Um, there's a lot of of um, CTC that is also comes through the animal undigested and, and very some very active metabolites and that is used in, in human medicine so it has importance for a, a medically important antibiotic. And then um, the last one selected was a Cepifer which was used in the beef and pork industry. Um, not as used as much in the livestock industry but it is a very important cephalosporin for um, human medicine. And so um, so those were the, the three um, antimicrobials that were selected to, um, to see if, if we could uh, use the flocculation. And so the, the idea was we'll have the antimicrobials, we'll have the diatomaceous earth, we'll combine them and, and make a, a solid that can be um, extracted from the, the manure. And so um, the, the first study was using this, this calcifer um, form of the diatomaceous earth, which is really a lab grade. Um, product and it has a pretty large surface area and so um, so so we assume that there were differences in, in binding mechanisms um, and so there were some initial studies done and um, really the the one of the um, let me see if I can click on here so I can jump off this one. Yeah. Okay so so one of these models assumed that there was um, uh, uh, monolayer sorption of the antibiotic and the other assumed that there was multi-layer sorption and uh, and so they concluded that that the the Lagmere model was was the appropriate was a better fit um, and that, but that there's probably a lot of complex um, combinations of binding mechanisms that are actually going on um, when we're trying to bind antimicrobials to um, to diatomaceous earth but the dominant process appeared to be um, ionic so, so then, um, then the, the first step was to determine if there was some interactions between pH dependency and, and the binding potential. And um, so, okay, so, so we have this, um, this the carbon nitrogen uh, bond is really the functional group there. And so when we, um, when we change the pH, which is shown in the red here, um, we interfered with this binding site. And so as pH increased, then the hydroxyl groups interfered with the, the covalent bonding sites. Um, and so we had a, um, we had a decrease in, in the um, bonding. And then the second thing that was looked at was the addition oops, I think I went one too much, of the urea. And that um, also interacted with, with a bunch of binding sites. And as we increased the urea, we, we decreased the binding. And then the final, uh, the final point was um, to look at potassium, which is, is a highly charged ion, and it also interfered with a bunch of the binding sites, and we had a significant decrease in binding when, when potassium was added. And so um, it was really, really important to, to understand all these binding characteristics in order to, to figure out how to, to best um, pursue the, the remainder of the project. So, so like I said, there was this Kesselpier, um diatomaceous earth that was available. It was a, a, a lab-grade product, but there was also um, raw diatomaceous earth, and this really had the greatest surface area and it had the greatest charged ions um, due to a large clay content in the diatomaceous earth. And then there was also a, a pool-grade um, diatomaceous earth, but this undergoes um, 
like some extreme heat, and so it's, it's physically and, and chemically changed. Um, and, and basically, as you'll see in future slides, we really ruled that it was pretty much inert. So, um, so the, the first study was to try all these different variations of the diatomaceous earth and, and see what we find. Um, and the, the pool grade really didn't do anything. Um, and, and we had the, the greatest binding was, was on the raw. Um, and this was, this was largely due to, um, to the amount of, of clays that were in the, um, in the raw and that um, created a lot of um, cation, uh, cation exchange um, sites so we could, um, so, so the um, antibiotic would bind really well. So, um, okay, so yeah, so we eliminated the, the, um, the cool powder one and then um, looked at the, at the effect of pH um, on these and, and really the, the raw almost appeared to be independent of, of pH. Um, but the, the lab grade, there was some um, decrease in binding when, when the pH decreased, or um, increased, sorry, um, past seven. And so, so based on that, so this was a, a prediction of, of what, um, where we might see some decrease. Um, and so then it was decided to try to use some alum because alum lowers the pH of the wastewater to try to lower the wastewater to about a pH of 6.5 to see if we can maximize some of this binding. And so, um, oh yeah, so the, the raw, di the raw diatomaceous earth really had the greatest capacity. Um, so again, why, why did we see these differences? And this was largely due to the clay content um, and the, the humeric acid kind of interfered with the, uh, um, the ionic bonding of these, um, of the, of the clays. But, oh, but first I should explain this about the septic here that, um, there was a complication when they added the excess alum because um, it started to um, to the removal of the sepiafer was decreased. And so Brian's theory was that maybe the, the alum formed some kind of a chelate. Um, and so he needed to do a little bit more work on that. But but this this organic coating um, on the diatomaceous earth kind of um, interfered with the, the binding sites. And so he added some hydrogen sulfide um, to, to degrade that, to digest it, and then that would uh, increase the, the binding of the clays. And so, yeah, that was successful then. And then as a bonus, um, when he uh, added the hydrogen sulfide, it also um, helps to increase the, the settling of the particulates. So, so basically when we, when we look about at the entire process here, if we have an anaerobic microbial resistance and we want to have some kind of remediation, there's there's kind of three ways we can do it. We can either restrict the use of the antimicrobials, not allow them to be used. Um, maybe there's some new alternatives out there, but as we know, there's not really a lot of new antimicrobials being introduced. Or we can try to do some remediation. And and that obviously is what this research is focused on. And and as far as what point in the process, um, you know, this this is remediation that's really going to look at, at the runoff and the and the cropland application. And so the way that, that this, this process would work or that, that Brian envisions this is, is you could have the diatomaceous earth, which is, is very cheap, it's natural, it's abundant. Um, you, you add it in with the wastewater and um, in this case we, we would use the raw diatomaceous earth because we had the best binding with that. Um, you have to mix it up. Um, the, the wastewater could be pre-treated with alum to remove the suspended solids, then you, you add the um, diatomaceous earth, you mix it up, you allow it to settle, and then um, you know the, um, the antibiotics are, are, are bound to the, the diatomaceous earth and then you can um, remove that. Um, the problem is that it, it works really well for positively charged antimicrobials. It doesn't work so well if you have something that doesn't have much of a charge on it. And so um, the next step that um, that, that the lab is working on is to try to make some, uh, some designer um, um, matrix binding agents that would maybe have some sort of a, a chelated pro product on them that you can mix with some raw diatomaceous earth so that um, you could also, oops, sorry, let's go back. Um, so you could also bind things that maybe have fatty acids on them or maybe you need to use some kind of a polymer 
Um, and then that would also have greater application because we could also treat uh, municipal wastewaters where we have things like, like hormones and, and a wider variety of, of antimicrobials. And so with that, I would just say if you have any questions, this is the guy that you really need to talk to. <laughs> but I, I could try and answer something if, if you want, or we maybe would be better um, spent using our time to ask any of the other, finish discussions with any of the other speakers. So. So Dan, Stephanie, Andrea, does anyone have any questions for any of them?